a passage in the canon, where Ananda Bindika was going to talk to some adherents of other sects. And they asked him, what kind of view does the Buddha have? And here Ananda Bindika is a stream winner. He's already had his first taste of awakening. He says, I don't know entirely what view the Buddha would have. He said, well, what about uh, the monks, his Arahant disciples? What kind of view do they have? He says, I don't know that either. I can tell you what view I have. And so that's what they discuss. What's interesting is that, as I said, Nanabindika has already had a taste of awakening, but he doesn't really know what the Buddha's view on things is. As in that simile on the, the leaves in the forest, the Buddha said he taught a handful of leaves. What he, the knowledge he gained in his awakening is like the leaves in the forest. It's a lot greater. And sometimes we wonder if the Buddha is being coy. Why doesn't he tell us more about the forest? Why do we have to wait for awakening to find out the answers to our questions, our other questions, besides the Four Noble Truths? Well, part of the answer may be is that once you get awakening, the questions you would bring just fall aside. They don't make any sense anymore. A classic comparison is the turtle who goes up on land, comes back down into the water, and the fish asks him what life is like up on the land. Is it wavy? Is it murky? What are the currents on land? And the turtle has to keep saying, well, it's not like that at all. It's not like water. And no matter how much he tries to explain it, the fish don't understand. And immediately there's a lot about awakening that, from our point of view, seems kind of strange. You wonder how it could be a goal. No greed, anger, and delusion. What fun would that be? It's like people on, on a ship out in the ocean, and they like rolling up and down in the waves. And they look on land and they see people in houses on land. So what could, fun could there be living in a house on land? There's no waves. But once you get on land, you realize that you're a lot safer. Storms can come out on the, on the ocean. Huge waves can come through and they can kill you. Whereas at least on land, if you have good, solid shelter, you don't have to worry about those things. And there's a sense of ease and security that comes from not having to go up and down the waves. So awakening is something very different from even what we could imagine, as they once said. The world is not only stranger than you imagine, it's stranger than you can imagine. Well, that really applies to awakening. It's something very other. But in the meantime, the Buddha doesn't leave us floundering around in the sea. He teaches us how to come ashore. And those are the teachings that are really important. The teachings on the Four Noble Truths, the different formulations of the path and the wings to awakening. These are pragmatic teachings. They serve a practical purpose. And there are resting spots on the way. True refuge comes only with full awakening. But in the meantime, we do need resting spots, places where we can settle in for a while, gain some orientation so that we're not totally at sea. Because the path, after all, is something fabricated. It's not your ultimate home. Even the concentration, the stillness that we try to create here, which is called a Vihara Dhamma, a home for the mind, is not an actual, the ultimate home, the ultimate refuge. But it's a resting spot.
The same with all the other factors of the path, like a right view. The Buddha is not concerned so much with giving us different views on the world or the self. He wants us to look at what is it to cling to a view. He has us turn around and look at the process. And being able to look at the process of having a view allows us to step back. and keep our sanity in the midst of all the, the waves and storms out of the ocean. Because it's so easy once you get into an unhealthy view to get stuck there. Because a lot of these views have their own internal logic, which don't give you any way out. Some views are actually destructive to the person who holds them. And as long as you stay in the world of that view, there's only one thing going to happen, is that you're going to be destroyed. Either your desire to do good will be destroyed, and sometimes your desire to live will be destroyed. So you need a way of getting out. And that's what the Buddha's right view does when he teaches about stress and the cause of stress. The cause of stress is clinging and craving. And one of the forms of clinging is clinging through views to things. Is that this causes stress, this causes suffering. So regardless of the content, you have to realize that there are views that are healthy and unhealthy. Ultimately, you have to let go of all of them. But in the meantime, you learn to hold on to some that are actually helpful, health, healthy as well. And one of the healthy views is this ability to look at the process of the mind's clinging to a view. If some views are helpful up to a certain extent, then you've got to drop them. Their meat, in other words, get their resting spots. But there come a point where they're no longer helpful. That's when the right view of the path is very useful. You can step back and pull yourself out of whatever the view has been. Because the views will tell you all about the world, and it, they take on a rea reality that they shouldn't have that way. And if you insist that your views are a representation of reality, there's no way you can let them go, because that's the way things are. But if you can see them as processes, then it's a lot easier to let them go. This principle applies to every aspect of the path. We work on concentration as a resting spot. It's not our ultimate refuge. Even when the Buddha talks about having Good friends is an essential part of the path. They're resting spots. They're not a refuge. So you have to learn how to use good friendship in a skillful way, but also realize its limitations. The friendship can't do the work for you. At some point, it's bound to end. But you learn how to rely on good friends for the help they can give, the advice they can give, the examples they can show you. As the Buddha said, if it weren't for him, where would we be? We'd live in a world where no one had really proven that it was possible through human effort to put an end to suffering. The dynamic of that world would be very different. It's because we have the Buddha's example that at least we keep open the idea of what might be possible. Now we're 
more likely to put in the effort. So even though these things are fabricated and ultimately will end, our relationships with people outside, the elements of the path, they are our resting spots. This is why the Buddha's basic distinction between skillful and unskillful is very useful. We look at things in terms of the results they give. And there's a wide gradation between really horrible, unskillful st stuff and the very, very highest level of skillfulness in terms of the path. And you learn to evaluate all the various activities, relationships, and other things you can get involved with as you're looking for the end of suffering. That's more or less skillful. And you try to sensitize yourself to see when is a particular element of the path something you want to hold on to, and when does the point come where you're going to have to let it go. When you learn to look at things in this way, then the question of, well, what's it going to be like at the end? That falls into the background. It's there as a promise. But you realize that no matter how you might try to conceive it, your conceptions can't do it any justice. So you work on the things that you can conceive. You can conceive the idea of some things being more skillful than others. You can learn to learn how to learn from cause and effect, looking at your actions, seeing where there are mistakes, learning how to come up with some new way of acting some new way of conceiving the possibilities of what you can do. You can't clone awakening, but you can clone what you learn about the path and then test it, test it, test it. So you develop the sensitivity you need so that when awakening comes, you'll know it. And when things that look like awakening come, but they're not, you'll know that as well, because your sensitivity has been developed. And you realize that whatever comes up, you've got to test it. And you accept that many of the issues that you bring to the practice might fall away as you go along. Questions that seem burning to you right now. As you gain awakening, you look at them and say, oh, those don't mean anything anymore. So try to keep in mind this distinction between refuge and resting spot. And John Fuang uses it in one of his Dharma talks. Various stages of concentration, he said, are resting spots. The breath is a resting spot. The different states of mind that you develop around the concentration, those are resting spots as well. You develop them because they're really useful. Always keeping in mind that someday you'll be in a position where you can let them go because they lead to something better. How much better? Well, find out for yourself.